this is one of the things I do for subscribers on Patreon, okay, is I am taking their questions and answering them in streams, usually at the end, um, for everyone, okay? Um, so here we go. So I'm going to my Patreon, all right? So here it is, the exclusive Patreon subscribers live stream to q and A. I I need to re-up this post. Uh, it's from all the way August 6th. And so here's the question um, from a, a routine a, a, a watcher and much appreciated a subscriber. Louis Ocilisti says, Hey, Danny, can you speak to the Bolsheviks' tendency for a rebirth of the Fourth International views on China, Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea as the formed worker state, i.e. state-owned economies not under the thumb of capitalist rule, but falling short of workers' control of industry? So then with, you know, lots of context here given, thank yous for this, you know, with all of the aggression, it seems the collective left is struggling to navigate how to demonstrate solidarity with the Communist Party of China against imperialist aggression, but also fighting for more than just achieving socialism in one country. Made, you know, China's made commendable gains and all that has been achieved. Some on the left still see China as countries with imperialist ambitions and Russia that seem to succumb to following for some manifestation of Cold War propaganda. How can the left balance a fair critique of China and other deformed worker state quote unquote bloc to work towards the goals of global socialist revolution, Bolshevism, and also commending the Chinese government for their rapid growth and success for improving the lives of people in their country amidst neocolonial and imperialist pillage by Western aggressive forces. I mean, this is a great question, right? This is the fourth international politics talking, and I've never been a fan, right? From the ISO to all sorts of tendencies, right? There's all so many tendencies within the fourth international. I'm not going to name them all. Um, but this is a problem I've encountered ever since, ever since. And I'm going to, I'm just going to close up uh, the Patreon uh, question. Uh, uh, this is a question that I have been dealing with since I started to study socialism and communism back in 2011, 10, 11, uh, a, a really troublesome thing. Actually, in Occupy Wall Street, these were the forces I first met, right, and, and was first introduced to uh, people outside of my own independent study handing me literature, right? Saying, hey, read us, right? Read the Spartacus, read uh, ISO, right? They were the ones saying, read us. They're always, they were always at demonstrations and they espoused by this analysis of actually existing socialist countries. And so I want to comment on two phenomena. So there's this deformed worker state, anti-communist orientation. And then now what I'm seeing online, at least, is a real debate about patriotism and how patriotism is reflected in actually existing socialist countries. So you have people defending socialist countries and saying, well, uh, we should all be American patriots because socialist countries like China and Vietnam are patriotic. So I want to address that because it's, it, they're all related. These are all what I would call distortions of materialism, of dialectical materialism, historical materialism. So the first distortion, this distortion of... Um, an understanding of socialism, right, is, is pure dogma. So deformed worker state is, to me, has a, an incredible tinge of racism. Now, what the Fourth International says is that everything up until Lenin's death is socialism, right? So the Soviet Union for uh, all the way up until the early 1920s, was a socialist country. And then after Lenin died and then the Stalin period occurred, and this gives me the idea, I want to get Lady Ildazar here, um, if I'm saying her name right, Ildazar. Ildazar. Uh, her work on the Soviet Union is great. She's been on the Deprogram content, po podcast. I follow her YouTube channel. I really want her to talk about the Soviet Union because this is a popular understanding among fourth internationalists, many of them being kind of like white-led, uh, I would say, uh, organizations. Uh, they have this idea that this deformed worker state happened in the Soviet Union and then everywhere else, right? So every other country that went the way of socialism is deformed because it doesn't have uh, their definition of socialism, which is uh, Soviet councils, right? Workers' councils and direct, they say direct worker control of the means of production. Now, to me, all of this itself is a complete misunderstanding of what socialism is in the Marxist sense. 
socialism in the Marxist sense is not 100% worker control over production. That cannot be achieved under actually existing conditions that we live under. You cannot just give workers, right? Uh, you can't just form workers' councils and say they're going to control everything. Marx is very clear in the critique of the Gotha program. And uh, Lenin is very clear in so State and Revolution that socialism is actually a dictatorship of the proletariat. In that dictatorship of the proletariat, you will have many various ways in which the proletariat exercise that dictatorship. It can't always be direct control. And why is that? Well, workers know how to know are generally closest to the means of production, but workers are generally not closest to managing them, if that makes sense, right? The idea that people now are just going to erase and eliminate class contradictions under socialism is folly and really just akin to ultra leftism, which says, no, we're just in the communist stage now. People are just controlling the means of production without classes. No. You have a need to, especially in underdeveloped colonial context, you have a need to develop the capacity of workers to be able to wrestle hold of the means of production and be able to administer them and advance them. So workers' councils are just one way that that happens. But the principal way is through control of the state machinery in a complete uh, uh, revolutionizing of the policies of that state machinery in the benefit of working people to advance their technological, educational, and uh, overall well-being, right? That is the goal. So if that's the goal, right, a dictatorship of the proletariat that does those things, then is China socialist? Absolutely. Because China has achieved all of that and has many different mechanisms for both popular administrative administration and control and also has uh the uh, you know does have institutions for workers control and production but also with an understanding that in order to advance the productive forces you need central planning high level of central planning and also the flexibility to allow capitalist market mechanisms right the capitalist market to exist in some highly regulated form so that you can also advance technologically. So this is why contradictions under socialism continue to exist. It doesn't make them not socialist, right? China's ability to regulate the market and to open up to capitalism in ways that the Soviet Union could not do does not mean that there isn't a dictatorship of the proletariat there. Because if there wasn't a dictatorship of the proletariat or of uh, the peasants and uh, the rest of the uh, uh, classes, right, that were exploited by imperialism and capitalism and feudalism there, then we would have a different situation. We wouldn't see the technological advancement, the educational advancement, and also the standard of living of all people in China go up the way that it has. We wouldn't have poverty eradication. We wouldn't have China leading the world and all of these different things. And you wouldn't have a governance system that is increasing its legitimacy. You wouldn't have Chinese people themselves saying, yes, we do get to vote for our uh, township and uh, uh, local uh, 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 delegates, right? Deputies. And then those deputies, right, in a direct democracy kind of structure, get to vote for the next level, municipal, provincial, all the way up to the National Assembly. You wouldn't have that trust in the government, in that kind of government, to get things done. So socialism, right, this isn't, this shouldn't be derogatory to understand. Socialism in these conditions, under world imperialism, under U.S. hegemony, under very delicate conditions, and under conditions where those pursuing socialism are poorer generally than Western capitalist so-called advanced countries, colonial countries, uh, that these countries need to take whatever possible means necessary to advance the productive forces and to ensure that the livelihoods of the people are met and that this 
corresponds with an overall dictatorship of the masses of people, of the workers, of the peasants, of the oppressed classes. So it's always been dogma for fourth internationalists or any socialists to say, well, you're not socialist unless you correspond with this narrow understanding of what the Soviet Union was like in the first experiment of socialism for the first five to seven to eight years, that that is the definition. Even the Soviet Union had to reform in the wake of, in the, in the wreckage of World War I, the invasion of 17 imperialist capitalist countries right after in 1918, the Soviet Union had to reform itself. It, it instituted the new economic policy, which was about increasing the productive forces and easing some of the policies that would uh, disrupt unity and disrupt economic development. And it worked really well. And it worked all the way up into the period um, uh, under the Stalin era where there, had, where there were then other changes. And then, of course, World War II happened uh, not too long after that. So, you know, once we we're in the mid-30s, we're in the Second World War. For the Soviet Union, of course, the Second World War started a lot sooner than uh, it did for the United States. So it's dogma to claim that socialism doesn't exist. It's deformed, too. But, I mean, in terms of fair criticisms, right, I think that no criticism of an actually existing country, socialist country, can occur unless we address the fact that imperialism is setting the conditions by which socialist countries can navigate and develop. So if you want to talk about Nicaragua still being poor, Still having a trouble, still having difficulties, right? Meeting certain markers, advancing economically. You have to talk about those brutal sanctions on Nicaragua from the United States. If you want to talk about China uh, having censorship um, of private social media from the West, you need to talk about how private social media from the West, from who many free speechers love, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, said and proved that actually uh, these intelligence forces behind the social media companies that are directly working with social media corporations in the West are infiltrating data, taking data sensor and from China. And that was proven, right? So unless you talk about and the DPRK, you're not happy about the DPRK nuclearizing? Well, uh, the United States is occupying South Korea, constantly threatening nuclear war, and is still technically at war with uh, the DPRK. Only an armistice was signed in 1953, and uh, if you don't know anything about history, then you don't know about how Korea was leveled and destroyed, especially the northernmost, Pyongyang and the north, northern part of Korea was leveled by the United States, right? More than 30% of the population was rendered homeless, 70 plus percent of all buildings destroyed, and biological warfare was used on and on and on. Nuclear weapons were threatened. So... And they were used not too long before in Japan uh, during World War II. So if we're going to criticize actually existing socialist countries for navigating, and this is what I hate about, because criticism can often be uh, another word for just subjective opinions. So if you want to have a subjective opinion about socialist countries like the DPRK or China without objectively analyzing the conditions by which these countries are navigating and developing socialism, then your subjective opinions just don't matter, right? And maybe you shouldn't even express them, not because you don't have the right to express them, but because they're not helpful, right? George Jackson said it uh, really wisely in Blood in My Eye. He says, not all opinions really matter. They don't. And so if your opinion doesn't matter, it's not going to affect anything positive for socialism, then it's not an opinion that we need.